Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. I'm joined today by Dan Fritter of calibermag.ca and Nicholas Johnson of thegunblog.ca. And we were requested to put together something talking about the proposed Bill C-21, what that means, what it looks like, uh, hopefully answer some questions that are out there from our perspective anyways. Nicholas, Dan, welcome. Thank you for availing availing yourself to this. Happy Travis for hosting this. So Bill C-21, we're getting a whole bunch of questions coming through. We're seeing some information, some misinformation, a lot of panic. Uh, we're seeing how it's already affecting businesses, even though it hasn't been implemented yet. Uh, and we're seeing, uh, some businesses, some organizations using it as a marketing tool and some political games as well being played. Hopefully, you know, the politics side of has never been my forte. I know you guys have more background there, more insight. Hopefully we can answer some of these questions and maybe maybe shed a little bit of light on what's going on. Um, Dan, you've been doing a lot of work with your magazine, (laughs) putting together information for people. I know we put a link in our last uh, newsletter that went out for people and some of the action that they can do. What have you been seeing? Where do you see things going? What can people do? I mean, to, to break from tradition, um, I'm going to sound like a bit of an optimist and say it, it looks like it's working. Um, mm-hmm. because what I saw over the weekend and growing into Monday with all the other stuff that was going on, like you referenced the organizations and whatnot was, uh, with the most important of them, the NDP, the liberals and the block is we started to see some splits come up. Um, we right. started to see Charlie Angus from the NDP. We started to see, um, Yves Blanchet from the block actually respond directly to a journalist on Twitter saying they do take issue with some of these amendments. Now, obviously, as a gunner, we wish that they would have taken a similar issue with Bill C-21 since the foundation problem is the same. It only impacts licensed gun owners. But nonetheless, Mm. um, as a gun owner, you have to learn to take what you can get to a certain degree. Um, And in that particular regard, we're starting to see the NDP and the block come around. Uh, And I think that is probably a direct result of a lot of the advocacy we've seen gun owners do. We've seen people sending out masses of three, 400 letters. Um, I know OFA has laid claim to a half a million letters going to Holy Ontario. Crow. Yeah. To, and when you consider that OFA's scope, OFA clarified their scope and said they've sent a half a million letters. Their members have sent a half million letters to Ontario MPs and MPPs. So, that's a huge footprint for a relatively small audience. And I think probably they're seeing similar things happen in the NDP and the bloc. So that pressure that's going out there, that, that I think it's working. I think we're starting to see um, hopefully some pushback taking form of that. Now, obviously, it helps when Carrie Price steps into the ring and goes, hey, this doesn't make a lot of sense. But <laughs> I don't think gun owners should, should sell themselves short on this either. Like the NDP and the bloc were already starting to walk this back before Carrie Price ever made his, his post. That was sure. already happening. We, we were seeing that happening on Friday. So they're starting to feel the pressure. Um, and I think that is the, the fracture that gun owners should be looking for. We should be making guns a nonpartisan issue. We should be looking for practical solutions, not political ones. Um, and this is a great step towards that, I think, personally. You know, that's the, that's the, the silver lining in this not very good cloud, but that's what I'm looking for. So if we back it up for the listeners, cause some people will be following this day by day, watching as new advancements happen. Some people are just getting into the fray right now and they're saying, hold on, what's going on? I heard they're coming after my hunting 
shotgun or my hunting rifle. Um, if we back this up a little bit of where C21 kind of started and what it looked like and kind of what advanced, what would that look like for the average individual? What do you mean? Well, uh, so C21 initially started off with, uh, as an amendment for some. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So C21 started out introduced. I mean, this is the second version of C21 that's been introduced even. So we could walk it back way farther, but for practical reasons, it was introduced as a bill aimed at freezing handgun sales primarily. Um, Well, to be quite honest, it was a bill aimed at getting votes because freezing handgun sales doesn't really have any public safety aims whatsoever any more than adding more red flag laws does when you've got existing ones. So it was largely a a political bill looking for political solutions to political problems. Um, Mm. And now they've added what is fundamentally the largest gun control act in Canadian history to it. It's a, it's a ban on all semi-automatic rifles. It doesn't include all semi-automatic shotguns by any stretch, but absolutely pretty much any semi-automatic rifle is center fire. Unless you happen to be one of maybe the six people that own a Sauer S303 with a two round Mm. integral mag and semi-automatic action, unless you own that one gun, you're kind of stuck with this. Yeah. So this is huge. I mean, C-68, all that other stuff, it didn't impact nearly as many rifles. Imagine if in C-68 they just said it's a semi-automatic rifle ban. It would have been, Mm. it would have been way bigger. And that's what they're doing now. So they've bolted on, you know, to what was effectively a mouse. They've added an elephant um, and they're just trying to sneak it in that way. It's, it's, um, but I think also too, that, that sneaking it in is also kind of the weakness. Like you have to kind of pull mm-hmm. back. If you take yourself out of the equation and if you were to say as, a, as an objective observer, and this is the first time I've done this particular thought observe experiment, but if you thought academically, if you bypass all the democratic institutions um, and you bypass all of the normal, the rules around bringing an amendment like this in, which normally it does meet some of the rules, but normally this would be asked, the minister would at least be asked to approach the committee and say, hey, we want to change some stuff. Here's why. They didn't do that at all. Um, It gives you a bit of faith in that. You know, that's again, Mm -hmm. if you're looking for silver linings, you look at this and you go, their biggest weakness was they didn't consult. They didn't follow any process. And the process is what makes good law. The process Mm -hmm. is what creates consultation, creates committees, creates witnesses, creates friction, so the one party in charge has a bit of friction, has to automatically make some concessions to the other people. Um, they didn't do that because they didn't want any of that friction. And now we're seeing that it kind of works. So I guess on the upside, you got to think that maybe this is the system working in a really perverse and backwards way. Um, it, it shouldn't have to work this way. This mm. feels like the safety net underneath the bridge that you already jumped off of catching you um, more than it does any kind of real safety thing. But uh, I think, you know, it's it's quite the progression if anyone's looking at it and going, well, how did C21 go from not affecting me to I can't take my bar outside? Well, a Tuesday, a couple of weeks ago, that's how it happened. <laughs> at, at, at the last moment there. So yeah. C21 essentially was they're approaching handguns. Now, C21 hasn't been enacted into law yet. No, it's too reading to it. in the committee phase. Clause by the, clause. That's when they brought this in. Okay. So it's... The handgun freeze has reached royal assent, according to the webs. So C-21, as a bill, it's gone through first and second reading in the House of Commons, uh, generally untouched. So the first reading is when they just introduce it, and it's the basic, like, I want to make a law, and this is what I'm thinking, and everyone goes, okay, that sounds like a good sentiment, maybe, sure, yeah. Then they do second reading, where it gets a bit more serious, it's supposed to be a bit more formal. They do that reading, and then it's like, okay, we've adopted that, that's what they've done so far. Then it goes to committee, and the committee is comprised, the committee is... You'll hear it colloquially referred to as SECU. It's the Standing Committee on Public Safety in the House. Uh, There's another similar committee in the Senate that does the exact same job. The bill then went to the committee. The committee discussed it. They had a bunch of witnesses called forward for two weeks, I think, was it? It was a relatively lengthy witness period. Nick would probably no longer because he covered that at length. Mm -hmm. Um, A couple weeks. Yeah, maybe even more. Th- I think, yeah. But maybe three a lengthy, like it was a, a lengthy, not as long as C-71 a few years ago, but true, yeah. a lot of witnesses. Yeah, so it was out there for a couple of weeks with everyone out there kind of chatting about it. And then, then after the committee goes forward with it, they, they finalize what's called clause by clause, where they go through mm. the bill literally clause by clause and they propose amendments to it. And that's where we're at now, where they've called all the witnesses, everything has been discussed, and they're supposed to be kind of... Like it's an amendment. It's supposed to be a, a whittling, if you will, not a complete 
restructuring. Um, mm. They kind of had all these witnesses and they went, well, you know, handgun free sounds great, but you know, it'd be better if we just ban all semi-automatic firearms, that'd be way cooler. <laughs> and, <laughs> and now the really, I mean, from a democratic perspective, we can't call witnesses. So the SECU committee, if you wanted to view it from this really naive perspective, these parliamentarians that are in the SECU are, are truly coming at it from an open mind. They can't call witnesses anymore. So if they wanted to discuss this stuff with you, me, Nick, Rod, whoever, they couldn't. They couldn't ask us to come up there and be like, hey, let's let's chat about this because let's restart the witness phase because we're completely mm. rebuilding this bill and we need to revisit it from the ground up. And actually, one of the big things that's really been concerning to me is that from a parliamentary standard, when you bring a bill about, you have to do various studies to make sure that it doesn't contravene the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Mm -hmm. um, a charter study was done on Bill C-21 when it was first introduced. It was determined to not break the charter because you don't have a right to a handgun. So, of course, it didn't. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't do another charter study. They haven't commissioned any consultation with Indigenous people. They haven't done any of the things you would have to do when you write a new law when they introduce this amendment, which effectively constitutes a new law. And, mm -hmm. and in that regard, you know, it's if you if you take a tiny law that does almost nothing and you add a giant component that does so much more and you don't study whether or not that that additional component contravenes the charter contravenes indigenous rights i mean dane lloyd and the committee's made very good points that this entire law might contravene the un declaration of indigenous peoples the rights of indigenous peoples wow. like it's cuz cuz they have to be consulted on this stuff and they just weren't right like it was just no, we, 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 and the comical part is like to put it in perspective, this is the government that won on this perspective of them being the champions of all these rights. Dane Lloyd asked in committee, has anyone in the liberal government asked anyone in the indigenous community if this law is going to work or if it, you know, never mind a full study, has anyone even asked? Mm -hmm. And the witnesses from the Justice Department who, suffice to say, work for the government had the, had the gall uh, to say, no, we kind of decided for them. In 2022, after all of this that's gone on, wow! they literally said, well, we kind of looked at it objectively, wrote a report as a bunch of white people that aren't indigenous. We kind of decided this was probably in their best interests. And it's like, wow, God, the hypocrisy. It's it's it is truly galling in that Oxford dictionary sense of the word, like stainless screw, aluminum, metal kind of galling, <laughs> just <laughs> painful. No one likes it. It's awful. Okay, so you go on the public safety website and they talk about the different items of the amendment and some are going to be coming in through OIC, through ordering council and some through royal assent. So since we've established that they're trying to approach us by royal assent, but it has yet to reach royal assent, one of the questions that came up was, how come the handgun freeze is in effect right now if it hasn't gone through? Can I, uh, can I offer an, an of opinion? Of course, Nicholas. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I want to, I want to commend Daniel on his incredible, uh, optimistic tone and looking for the positive here. I, I, and if I get down I'm and trying, negative, I'm bring me back, deep. man, bring me back. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, to, to your question about Bill C-21 and the origins, there were, there were a few things that happened on May 30th of 2022. That's when the government announced their intentions of the current version of Bill C-21. Part one was the intention for an order in council to kill the handgun market, to make, to criminalize buying, selling, transporting, uh, bequeathing handguns. So mm. they were going to do that by order in council. That means executive decree. And par part two of that was they were going to do it in legislation. That's Bill C-21. So they announced yeah. both of those three things on May 30th. They also announced a third thing on May 30th that they would add an amendment to expand their confiscations of shotguns and rifles. Remember back in May of 2020, they announced a big confiscation on, uh, I'll, I'll call it AR-15s and uh, other, a lot of other semi-auto center fire mag fed rifles and shotguns. They said, so that they did that in May, 2020 on May 30th, the third component of, of the confiscations was they're going to expand that through an amendment. Mm. And that's what we're talking about now is that giant, uh, amendment of, of, uh, who knows how many hundreds of thousands of, I've seen numbers over a million of rifles and shotguns. So it's the expansion through that amendment, but that order in council to kill the handgun market, that's already gone through. And now we're seeing the, into law, the order in council of May, 2020, plus this huge expansion. 
Got it. It's a little misleading when you it's, read the public safety it, website. It's, it's really, well, also this is really interesting. I, I think that it's to, to, to expand on or add to what Daniel was just saying. It's, I think this is, it's devious. It's sneaky. This last minute stuff, whether it's legal or not, because I think it probably is legal by some interpretations, but even if it's le even, even if it is legal, it's sneaky. This is not how it should be. And I also want to to commend you again for for bringing this to your podcast because just to give an anecdote on on page views at thegunblog.ca, I was just looking at this after the May thirtieth announcement. In the week after, I looked at the page views, and my page views after this announcement of uh, November twenty second, when they unleashed, uh, when they, when they published the uh, the amendment, I've got four times as many page views this time around. So just wow. as an indicator of how broad the interest is, how broad the concern is. And another point that Wes Winkle made of the, the president of the Canadian Sporting Arms and Ammunition Association, mm -hmm. he pointed out that the May 30th announcement, that was the prime minister, that was a, that was a telegraph media announcement. There were press releases. The prime minister had lined up the media. They were all there with their cameras and their notepads to, to broadcast this. There was huge media coverage of the May 30th announcement. The November 22nd announce, announcement, there was practically no media. So this mm -hmm. huge interest that we're seeing is predominantly grassroots. It's people reading Caliber, it's the gun blog, it's Silver Core, it's, it's Ian Runkle, it's, 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 it's this grassroots, and, and the organizations, you know, the, 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 the other gun orgs, it's completely grassroots. Mm. And the level of interest, uh, the, the, the half, the OFAH, right, the half million letters to MPs, it's, it's just staggering. It's unlike anything that I have ever seen personally. I've only been following this a few years, but from what I'm hearing, it's unlike anything anyone has ever seen. And this is where, like, I'll interject and say, like, it's interesting as someone that's been following this for a long time, because, I mean, Nick can probably attest, uh, and and you as well, Travis, from your background, that in a lot of these things, when we see these bad policies come out or we see these mistakes happen, more often than not, it, it's, to be quite honest, it's usually something attributable to ignorance, where it's, sure. it's someone that's a... And I don't mean this like people are going to hear this and misinterpret that I've got some like I mean no animosity. This is just people doing their jobs. You have a public sector employee who has worked their way through maybe agriculture or any other department and they see an opening in the next classification of job up because I mean all these public sector stuff is incredibly hierarchical. So they just kind of plug them into the next module up in the in the earnings category and it's over in public safety and it happens to be in the policy shop and it happens to be with firearms. Do you have any experience? Mm -hmm. Well, no, but you've been in the, to be quite honest, in the situation, I've never worked for the government, but I, I can see a situation where like, it's more important that you have knowledge of how the government works than how guns work to work mm -hmm. for the government on guns, if that makes mm -hmm. sense to people. Because yeah. mm -hmm. um, probably maybe the government thinks it's easier to teach guns than it is to teach the very complicated bureaucracy that is public policy. And then you mm -hmm. get these people that get into these roles that don't have the experience and they're being told various things by various people and they come up with something they think meets these goals, which is to be quite blunt, what I think this was. Um, mm -hmm. And the politicians go, yeah, okay, well, the experts say this will work. And I think basic group think happens where the, the bureaucrats on the inside are referred to as the experts for long enough. The politicians believe them, forgetting that these people were promoted in through agriculture and don't really have expertise <laughs> per se. And then everyone just goes, yeah, this looks good. The experts say so. And that's what we see in committee. I mean, that last committee hearing um, last week where we started to see Murray Smith and justice mm -hmm. witnesses effectively directly kind of going against what one another were saying with what would or would not be banned, where justice was saying, well, it's if the gun was originally designed with a five round magazine, which is not how Murray Smith has been interpreting these words right. for his entire career. Right. You start to go, this doesn't. I know there's, and again, this treads on some people. There's a lot of people who think there's victimhood and animosity and acrimonious. I think it's just the government kind of being dumb, to be quite blunt. I think they kind of went, hey, bureaucrats, come up with a solution to help us ban these guns. This was the solution. They rolled with it, and they never looked at it, quite okay, honestly. So maybe, 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 let's, let's say being dumb, but... This amendment that came on is what, 300 and like 30 or 13, something like that pages long. That would take a while to put together. And the execution of putting that forward doesn't sound like it was coming from a place of ignorance. 
Like the idea of that we'll just tag this on at the very end where we kind of bypass. But I guess that depends on who you're, who you, depends on who you call an expert. Cause I mean that the 330 pages is largely based on, if we're being honest, cause I also think that as gunners, we've got to be honest. It's a huge amendment, 330 pages. It's really easy to say they plan this out forever because of the length. Sure. We could distill this down to 10 pages if you wanted to, right? Like you take out all the AR-15 variants, you're probably left with a document that's maybe 50 pages. You take out the French side, that's 50% of it, and well, you're left with 20. Then you take out all the other, you know, well, the VZ-58 known as, you maybe got two pages, you know, of, okay. of an actual synopsis of here's what we're looking at banning. That's obviously Murray's head list. We've all known that. It's from the mm -hmm. 2020 thing. It's been circulated. It's also... Very much parallel to the list that's been circulated by Pauli saint Suvian and the Coalition for Gun Control. The notable gun on the list that you got to look for to draw that parallel is the Robinson Arms XCR. Mm. It's never been involved in a shooting. It's mm -hmm. They're not common. They're, they're pretty uncommon. Even back in the day, they weren't common. Um, never been involved in high-profile shooting whatsoever. It's been involved in all of these bans ever since. And it's been on Pauli's lists and gun control's lists since day one. When you hear Marco Medicino say things where he says like, oh, Mark Lapine was captured by a gun registry at Polytechnic. No, he wasn't. But that's what Poly St. Sufian told him. So you mm. can kind of just use some pretty elementary deductive reasoning skills. Go, well, they're just consulting with Poly St. Sufian, which is not an expert on guns. They're an expert on what happened at Polytechnic, which doesn't necessarily, you know, everything right. about a car crash doesn't make you a car expert. Exactly. I've used that one before. Just because I've been hit in the face, it doesn't make me a boxer, right? It's, yeah. Um, so what about the Plinkster? I understand. I haven't read through the whole list there. Is the Plinkster not a little 22? Is that on the list there? It is. That was okay. on the May, that was already listed in May, 2020, I think. Yeah. The Mossberg 702 Plinkster. So the 702, the 715, the Blaze previously, because that's essentially a Plinkster with a, um. AK style uh, plastic wrapper. Yeah, I just put a plastic wrapper on the thing. I, from what I understand, the very original ones that came through, I've actually seen photos of them where they've taken them apart in videos and you've got a 702 Plinkster in the middle. Or, yeah, it's, it's uh, like every other 22. You just. What do they, what do they have against that rifle? Now this rim fires are on there. Well, and I got to say, some credit goes to Tim Thurley over on Twitter, who's done some extensive work on the definition of variant and filed his own A-tips and whatnot. Okay. Um, so credit goes to him on that. Variant apparently can include guns that look like other guns. It's as simple as that. The government has decided that the ver variant includes guns that look like other guns. So if gun A looks like gun B, well, I guess they're variants of one another. So and Murray Smith testimony in the federal court case is also from, I think, October of, I think it's 20, gosh, I'm having a, uh, unsure if it's 2021 or 2020, but his testimony under cross-examination like Daniel saying, like a variant is anything that Murray Smith and his colleagues want it to be. Right. It's not that, that. that huge issue that we've been dealing with for, uh, for years. Yeah. There was two terms. What was a variant? And the other one was a modified version of, I think were the two terms okay. that yep. would never be, uh. Can't be defined. They can't be defined and they won't be defined because they want to leave it open to. But I think like, and this is again, not to interrupt, but like. No, screw it. To interrupt because I'm doing it. I'll own it anyway. Go ahead. Like this definitions thing, people get hung up on this because I know it's very common in the gun community to get hung up on the variant thing. People are very variant sensitive in the gun community. I would ask people to also recognize like these definitions, the definition of the term hunting gun is equally nebulous. Like it is Absolutely. a gun that you hunt with. So when they say, oh, mm -hmm. well, it's banning hunting guns. Well, of course it is because any gun that you could legally take into a field and shoot an animal with is a hunting gun. Like it, it's as simple as that. Like when, when people say, well, what's an assault rifle? Well, assault rifle does have a canonized definition. A rifle intended for military use is primarily with a fully automatic fire switch. That is an mm. assault rifle. You detach a magazine, typically 30 rounds, et cetera, et cetera. If you look it up in the Oxford English Language Dictionary, it's there. Most crucially, if you look it up in the APA, the, or the um, journalist one, What's that one? Canadian Press or Associated Press? Associated Press. Yeah. Associated Press has a definition for assault rifle. It is a fully automatic rifle, period. That's it. Hunting rifle has no such definition. And uh, I so think that's the crucial thing. They, when they say this is an assault weapon ban, we're not banning hunting rifles. There's no freaking difference. They're all semi-automatic rifles. The end. I would also suggest that we not use those terms unless it is except in specific circumstances because today in 2022, 
uh, you, uh, you guys are the technicians, so I'm stepping outside my lane here, but the, the idea that some firearms are different than other firearms, there's a, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is they're all made in the same factories. They're all designed by the same engineers. They all come through the same, uh, well, factories, uh, retail channels, or I guess even who, who um, and the people who use it might be different, but to make a distinction that, oh, this is a military gun. This is a hunting gun. This is a ranching gun. This is a farming gun. This is a self-defense gun. I don't think that type of language serves us or, or even it, it might be useful for some purpose, but it, it, it doesn't have a, it's not, it's not a useful distinction. I don't think. No. And I think again, to expand on that, I don't like the, this discussion around what guns are has been one that's been kind of problematic for me. It's been frustrating for me because, um, what guns are designed to do is to launch a projectile. Full yeah. stop. And I think a lot of gun owners, like if anyone's listening to this, whenever someone brings that up and says, well, what's a, you know, we got to ban these, they're designed to do blank. Yeah. If whatever blank is, is not throw a rock at high speed downrange accurately and reliably, the answer is incorrect. Because that's mm -hmm. all, like I know, I literally have talked to people that design guns. And if you go to Colt Canada, they say that, no, we don't design these to do anything other than go bang, make the, the bullet hit where it's aiming and do it reliably. And then the other added design parameters are things like light, like whether or not it's lightweight, is it heavy, how long is the barrel, it's basic stuff. But guns are designed to go bang and shoot. That's it. Guns are designed to shoot. What you mm -hmm. shoot at is where the person enters into it. And that's, that's a whole different metric. And I think this whole assault, assault style hunting gun, these definitions do a tremendous disservice to distract from that, that they are just guns. They can yeah. be tremendously dangerous in the wrong hands. Absolutely. That's why we invested heavily in this massive system to keep them out of the wrong hands. Why are we now investing heavily in specific kinds of guns in the right hands? It doesn't make sense. It's like calling it an assault vehicle. This one's an assault vehicle because it was used or it's got X weight or it's X capacity. Painted, it's painted black. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or like we've got leadership style government. Doesn't necessarily mean we've got a functioning <laughs> government either. <laughs> Travis, I'd also like to come uh, just to also to zoom out here to, um, I think a lot of gun owners were surprised by what happened uh, when the, when this amendment to Bill C-21 was introduced or, or published. And I think that's also unfortunate because we mm. had huge signs, both, both in the short term, we have a government under the Justin Trudeau liberals and Justin Trudeau himself, who is very uh, clearly, obviously hostile to, uh, to gun owners. He's campaigned three times. Now he's won three elections with a message of prohibitions and confiscations. So mm -hmm. the, the fact that this happened shouldn't be a surprise. On May 30th, the government said they were planning an amendment to expand the confiscations. So it shouldn't be a surprise from that point of view. And bigger picture, back in C-68 of, of 1995, the, the Firearms Act, the, the Anti-Firearms Act has, or, or this, let me rephrase that. C-68 has uh, an amendment to the criminal code that allowed cabinet to ban any gun that it wants anytime if cabinet doesn't think it's reasonable for hunting or sporting purposes. Mm. So the minute that was in the law, we should have known. And a lot of guys who paid attention back then did. That's way before yep. my time, before, way before I was interested, but I'm, I'm relying on stories that have been related to me. Anybody who was paying attention should know that that, the fact that that was in the criminal code and the fact that all gun owners are regulated by the criminal code meant it was not a matter of if, it was a matter of when. So right. that, plus Trudeau saying he's uh, cracking down, he's uh, adding prohibitions and confiscations. So I can understand people would be upset or angry about what happened uh, on November, uh, November 22nd of 2022 when the amendment came out, but nobody should be surprised. Right. The writing's on the wall. Yeah, it's been on the wall for, for either decades or months, but mm -hmm. yeah. There's also another thing that I just want to add to that, that, in, in, and this is being positive. I think that what we're seeing now, the thousands of people, maybe tens of thousands who are watching the SECU committee in the House of Commons debate this bill and who are paying attention to the policy at all, because there, I think there are a lot of people who are paying attention. It's serving as a very valuable political political education mm. about how policy is made, how the legislative process works. And Going back right to the beginning of the things Daniel was mentioning about this last minute amendment, after all the witnesses has come in, snuck in under the wire, all this stuff, um, introducing a massive amendment that was not presented to parliament, all this stuff is making people very suspect 
of this government and about government ethics and the political system. And I think that's actually dangerous because we Mm -hmm. need trust in politicians. We need trust in the system to function as a society. That's, that's my opinion. And this kind of stuff, the way it's being done, nothing to do with firearms, just purely the procedural aspect is undermining trust in politicians and the political system. I think that's dangerous. Well said, Nicholas. I, I want to talk about the, the terms, uh, hunting guns and uh, assault weapon a little bit, but you know, one point on what you were just saying there, C21 encompasses more than just firearms, doesn't it? I, the only aspect I paid attention to is firearms, but it sounds like you, it sounds like you know something. (laughs) Well, I know very, very little on this, but I think Daniel probably has a little bit more information. Covers more than airsoft. You're talking about the airsoft. Yeah. I mean, it. It's obviously impacting airsoft and then broader reaching kind of brackets or, or parenthesis around firearms is the red flag laws and all the additional work around um, exemptions for things like nuclear facility guards to carry AR-15s and stuff like that. Because apparently AR-15s are the only tool that is acceptable for our nuclear facilities to be defended with, but you can't have one. Um, yeah, the biggest thing is airsoft. Um, it bans airsoft. Okay. That's all there is to it. There's no other way to put it. I mean, it doesn't yeah. ban it. I mean, being a bit glib there, but um, it basically bans anything that's a replica firearm. And if anyone's familiar with Airsoft, uh, Airsoft is all about, for most people, about Milsim. It's about the simulation aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can't really simulate uh, those situations if you've got some funky Nerf-looking space doodad that you, you stick to the BBs in the side of or something like it's, Mm. you know, kind of ruins it. So, and plus too, this is something that Canadian gunners have to realize because it's, it's where airsoft and gun owners overlap significantly. We're not a big market. Canada is not a significant airsoft market. We are not a significant gun market. Full stop. Like there's no other way to put it. I I used to argue this point when I was 10 years ago and doing the industry, I was gung ho. Canada's big. No, we're not like they sell Mm. more guns in Texas than they do in Canada. Um, Mm -hmm. And in terms of airsoft, globally, there are other bigger markets by far. Um, What the liberals are looking at doing ostracizes the Canadian market for both. Uh, It requires Canadian airsoft people to find a product that does not currently exist on the market today to practice airsoft as they currently do. So they're either Mm going to have to change their behavior to to meet the law, not that their behavior is currently criminal. They're going to have to change their currently law-abiding, currently entirely unharmful behavior to be unharmful and law-abiding some more with different stuff (laughs) because no one's going to build guns for them. And it's the same as Canada. I've seen a few people kind of say on social media, well, I guess we're going to have to redesign magwells. We're going to have to... No, it's not going to happen, guys. Like, Like, designing a magazine is one of the most expensive parts of designing a gun because it sees a ton of wear and tear. It's very diverse in terms of your metrics where things have to line up, measurements, you name it. It's very, very complicated. Like to the point where a lot of gun designers say designing a reliable gun is as important as designing a reliable mag and then you wrap a gun around it. Mm -hmm. You're going to really expect people to go out there and design a whole new magazine format that cannot be replicated anywhere in the world to hold more than five rounds Mm. for a market of 2.2 million people. Mm -hmm. How many of those 2.2 million people are buying new guns every year? Well, not all 2.2. Okay, so let's take those people. Now you're getting to the market size. It just won't happen. These laws will not be adapted to by the market. They will meet their objectives in that goal of evergreening legislation that will prevent gun owners from circumventing it because there's no point. Mm-hmm. But that's just the death knell of it. It doesn't, it's not, it's not like airsoft is adapting, it's dying, mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. over. Like so there, no one will make a semi-automatic rifle for the Canadian market. Yeah. If you're rich enough, you can go buy a Sauer S303. Mm-hmm. Someone will sell you one. They're custom made. You call them up, give them your name. They'll put it on the side of the gun. Mm-hmm. But if you don't have five grand, well, I don't know, go buy something else, I guess. That's what Trudeau would say. Like it's something else that's, Equally good, but worse, you know, like follow up shot with a bolt action rifle, never as good. You know, as as an animal advocate guy, this pisses me off to no end. I think also, Dan, what you're saying is incredibly important and it answers the question that, uh, that I've seen on social media that, that some people are asking to say, oh, I don't have any guns that are on the list. So therefore this doesn't affect me. 
and that's that's false. You might not be targeted by the yeah. confiscations directly yet, yeah. But how are you affected? Well, every gun owner in Canada is affected because as the market shrinks, well, some manufacturers are going to simply say, you know what? The Canadian market is not worth it to us. That's gun manufacturers mm -hmm. and that's ammo manufacturers. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what does that mean? Well, you're a gun owner who, who shoots whatever. Well, you, you're used to buying your ammo at your local gun store. Well, is your gun store going to be able to make it through this? Maybe, maybe not. And let's say your local gun store makes it through it. And let's say you're used to going the day before you, before a hunt or the day before a, a range event, a range day and, and stocking up on a, a couple boxes or, or dozens of boxes. Well, are the ammo manufacturers still going to serve the country the way they do now? Because, and so we're talking about, um, some gun stores disappearing and dying. We're talking about gun clubs eventually disappearing and dying. So this, this confiscation is suppressing the huge, well, the, the relatively, like, like, that's all, suppressing the Canadian gun market. And that has ramifications on everybody who is in the Canadian gun market, every gun store, every gun club, every gun owner. So, I mean, to put that in perspective, if anyone's wanting to know about context on that from an industry side, imagine going to the range with a Lee Enfield. How many rounds are you probably taking for an afternoon? Let's say you get mm -hmm. there after lunch, you're going to leave before dinner. You probably, if you're me and you're taking, let's say my K31, I'm going to call 50 rounds ample. That's, I probably come home with half of them because I'm, I'm just there to plink away and, and practice breathing and all that. Now imagine you go into the range with an AR or WK-180 to practice three gun matches. How many rounds are you taking? Hundreds, right? A lot more, yeah. right? That's what the retailers are seeing. When you worry, when, when, when Nicholas says this is going to affect your retailers, think about that. Think about every gun owner. If you're listening to this in a big city like Toronto and you're talking about Al Flaherty's or you're listening to in Red Deer and you're talking about a small shop there, doesn't matter. Maybe the powder keg and Kamloops could be a reliable gun. This is a huge reduction in volume. And that's going to have dramatic effects. So even if you don't shoot these guns, let's say you're that guy that only shoots the Lee Enfield. Well, your box 303 is going to go a hell of a lot more in terms of price. Because the lease, the reliable gun, the powder keg, everyone else has to pay, which has gone up tremendously because real estate under Trudeau. Mm. That lease still has to be paid, except instead of being paid for on thousands of rounds of 223 or 762 like it normally would be, it's going to be carried by guys shooting 20 rounds of 303. You got so it. Every one of those rounds is going to go from one to maybe five bucks even. Like we are looking at effectively, if people want to know where this goes, the European gun culture, where if you can afford it, it's a great sport. And if you can't, try baseball. Tough. Tough. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, yeah. fishing. Like it's really that. There's no other way around this. It's they're moving so it's it into that for the rich. And if you're Joe Blow, blue collar hunts for your food, you're SOL, man. And I've spoken with numerous gun stores, you list off a few of them right there, about the effects that they're seeing currently. And the same thing keeps coming back. The people who want to buy new kit and buy lots of ammo, those are handgun shooters, sport shooters, people who are shooting the semi-automatics. The handgun, when that announcement came in, there was a surge on buying, but there's no new guns being bought. This has all been addressed before. It's the same number that would be sold over a year. It's just sold over a condensed period of time. It was an untenable thing for the stores and now they're seeing the repercussions very quickly. If C21 goes through, Dan, what you're saying will come into effect. It's already largely coming into effect. You're going to see layoffs. You're going to see small stores shut down or really niche down and prices go way up. Um, one thing that we talked about earlier was about terms. And I know the lawyers were really keen on pushing, let's say Murray Smith on, on saying what a variant was or what a modified version was. I know earlier we'd mentioned maybe not, let's not get hung up on these terms because there's a double-edged sword there. Uh, legally, sometimes if there's no legal definition of what, let's say what an assault weapon is or an assault rifle is, uh, they will, they'll go to the Oxford dictionary or they'll look at us law. They'll look at other places where it's kind of been defined and, and lean on that. Uh, I think the lawyers really wanted a definition of a variant to constrain future, uh, prohibitions and put a box around what it is they're looking at. And the very telling point is, is that nobody wants to put that definition on. If we move forward and we're talking about, like you say, this is a hunting rifle or going after the hunting rifles, 
I don't know. I look at this two ways. Uh, number one is giving some, uh, context to those who are outside of the firearms industry and saying, well, that, that doesn't really make sense. Why would they go after, uh, indigenous groups who, who use this firearm predominantly? Why would they go after the farmer or the hunter? And I can see some value into leaning on that. I do understand the gun owner standpoint of saying the second we define hunting rifles, everything else is going to be gone. And these are the only few until they whittle that down further. I, I, I'm torn on the two sides of that. It's kind of like saying, never call it a weapon. It's a firearm. Well, the criminal code actually calls it a weapon, right? Even the receiver, a weapon is anything that is used, can be used, designed to be used to threaten, intimidate, or cause bodily harm to somebody else. And without precluding the generality of the foregoing includes a firearm. Words are important. Where should people stand on this one? Should we be doubling down and saying, <laughs> look at what they're doing to the hunting firearms, or should they try and distance themselves from that? I'd like to respond to that. Okay. I would say I agree with you and that it's, it is a double-edged sword and there's, there's pros and cons to each one. I think the, the advantage of using phrases like farming gun, hunting gun, ranching gun, uh, target gun mm. is that it, it makes it sound nice and it's maybe ap appealing to certain people. Mm. The risk is that we forget that it's the same guns that are used by military, uh, self-defenders, home defenders. It's, it's exactly the same tool. Mm. That's the first thing. The second thing is I, th I've chosen to, in, in my coverage at the gunblog.ca to, to, in my, in my presentations and, and discussions, focus on the confiscation from people. Cause we have to remember we, it, it's, it's simpler to say that they're going after X, Y, or Z guns, but we have to remember that the confiscations are always targeting certain people. Right. At the, at the end mm. of the day, it's, it's not the gun that's legal or illegal. It's the possession, the purchasing, the acquisition, the, oh, the, the, the having, buying, owning, and that's a human activity. So mm. it's to bring the people back into this and remember that they're not, I even prefer to say they're not going after guns. They're going after people. And Daniel said this from in his opening sentences, government licensed firearm users. Now, this is where we get to the con side. That's a, that's a mouthful that like, what the heck is a government licensed <laughs> firearm user? It's much easier to call it. They're going after hunting guns. So rhetorically, mm. if you have to make an ad or a meme, they're going after hunters is much, it's conceptually much center, much simpler. So there's a huge advantage there. Does it come back to bite us in the bum in our, in our policy discussions? I think it does. So pros and cons, man, pros and cons. And I think like from my perspective, I, I echo Nick's sentiment entirely. Like I agree with everything he said. Um, mm. I, I have no, there's nothing really to add beyond, like I think maybe gun owners maybe just get too hung up on the terminology. Yeah. Because mm. I used to, I, I've been guilty of it. I think a lot of us have been at various junctures. And at this point I can say like my background is, is primarily in writing and English literature. So I kind of rely more on the, the language purity. A gun is absolutely a weapon. It can also mm -hmm. be a tool. It can also be a fishing weight. It can also mm -hmm. be a hunting rifle. It can be whatever you want it to be. You know, like you can strap it to the tire of a car and use it as a ski in the snow if you want to. It's it's just a metal implement, right? Like it is a mm -hmm. thing that's commonly called a gun. What you add to that is kind of secondary and is more projection. And this is how I viewed it. I think gun owners would be beneficial is maybe get caught up on how other people refer to it less and correcting them less and maybe infer from their usage more. Like if someone refers to a gun as a weapon constantly, maybe instead of correcting them and being like, no, they're not weapons, maybe infer that that person has a little bit of hesitancy around guns. They have a little bit of an acrimonious attitude. They're a little bit nervous. And the best way to address nervousness or ignorance, which is commonly what that comes out as, is not by just steamrolling over them and being like, no, you're wrong. Right. Um, so I just don't get caught up in it. If someone's, because I've done tons of interviews where people call them weapons, rifles, guns, you name it. It doesn't matter if you've been in the army and someone calls it a gun, they'll bitch slap you back and say, no, that's, that's an artillery piece. That's a rifle, you know? So mm -hmm. it's, names are, are really more about who's using it than, than, than what it actually is. And I think gunners get too caught up in that stuff. And I think we let our politicians get caught up in it too. Cause it, and this is where this hunting gun thing, it exposes a bit of a mutual flank for both the conservatives and liberals. Cause the liberals have to kind of admit 
that an AR-15 is just a semi-automatic rifle, no different than a Browning BAR at some point. Mm -hmm. And at Mm -hmm. some point, someone, and believe me, I'm sure that there is someone in a liberal war room that's a little bit worried about someone holding up an AR-15 round and holding up a BAR-30-06 round and going, yeah, Mm. this rifle shoots these, four of them, as fast as you want. The other one shoots these. Um, So they're worried about that. The conservatives, on the other hand, are also worried about it because they want to be seen as defending hunting guns because that's socially acceptable in Canada. But they also have to accept someone. Eventually, reality has to accept that there's no difference. A semi-automatic AR-15 and 223 is just as good at hunting coyotes as a semi-automatic AR and 30 6 is at hunting elk. They're just guns. And uh, we should, by that, I agree also that we should be calling, um, in certain cases, we should be referring to the AR-15 as a hunting gun. Because it's in- It's the most popular hunting gun in America. It, in the world, right. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, because it's the largest hunting market. So, so the AR-15, the in the world. so we've, 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 uh, I, 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 I avoid referring to firearms as weapons because I think uh, philosophically they are not. But I also agree, Dan, wholeheartedly with you that that's that's they can that's, be like that. That's a that's a discussion that about three people are interested in. I'm uh, people who yeah, like to splice exactly. hairs, mm. and three of us are interested in the the. But all three the, of us are in this one podcast. <laughs> oh my god! And that's and that slippery. What are the slope. odds? I think you're also pointing to a slippery slope of, of how this policy is, is being rationalized. First, they say, oh, you can't use it for hunting. Oh, and part two, since you can't use it for hunting, you don't need it. Oh, and so let's just confiscate them. So the, it's, it's a minute, that's where those people who say, no, we draw the line at the, the first step is where we draw the line. Because once they go take that first step, there's always the second and then the third and, and that is the fourth. Absolutely true. Like in committee, I remember vividly last week, Justice Witness, and this is a this is a non-political public sector employee working for the Justice Department who had, again, the gall when the Benellis were brought up to simply say, well, they were banned in 92, so obviously they don't have any practical reason because they've been illegal since 92. Right. Like that somehow, like being banned in 92 prevents them from being useful. And and Nick's right. They're going to do this. They're going to say these guns. They're going to ban them. If they do ban them today, these guns will never be considered viable hunting rifles in the future because they'll simply say, well, no, they're illegal. They have been illegal. You have kind of like the Air 15 in Canada is not a viable hunting rifle because you're not legally allowed to hunt with it. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy effect. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, same with handguns in same. the bush. You can't. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I always figured Alberta, Alberta should come in because the only thing that stops people from shooting a handgun in the, in the woods is that your ATT, which allows you to transport it to a range, not out into the woods. And ATTs are given out provincially, it, although. You'd know more about this being the, the, the hunting guy, the hunting, well, definitely more than me. Like is, could you be able to hunt in Alberta with a handgun if the CFO said so? Yeah. I mean, they do it in the States. I remember being down at the well, I know, Massachusetts. Could, but legally, like, could, oh, could I see. the CFO of Alberta legally, without rewriting the F, the, the Firearms Act, like with the current framework, issue an ATT to someone for like a, a 44 mag, and then I, that person have a, a tag for a deer and go get I, a deer with a, a handgun? Would that be legal? So we have federal and provincial laws and provincial yeah. laws, uh, if your province says you're good to go and use a handgun, then the federal laws say... I uh, kick in, mind you, ATTs, and this would be great to have Ian on because I'm no lawyer, but the uh, <laughs> ATTs are issued provincially from my understanding. That's one of the things they're trying to, uh, to change and have a federal oversight on all ATTs as, as we a- move forward. ATCs. Well, an ATC is also something that you can bring so, out, but it'll have conditions attached. I think, AT, I think they're moving the ATCs to the RCMP federally for ATCs for protection of life, but the okay. ATTs. I think that's I, part of C21, isn't are, it? Yeah. Yeah. But the ATTs yeah. I believe are staying, are there, I don't think that the, 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 the regulatory body for ATTs changes as, as far as I know. Again, hashtag not a lawyer. Um, the, tri- on that question though, is, isn't it the, isn't it, I'm, and I'm not a hunter, not a lawyer, not a hunter. Mm. Uh, is it not, um. My understanding was that it's illegal in Canada federally to hunt or to use a quote unquote prohibited or quote unquote restricted firearm for hunting. You can only use a non-restricted and therefore handguns are automatically out. So that would be a provincial rule, uh, depending, I don't, I don't, I don't know every province, but the provinces govern the, uh, the use of implements for hunting, whether that be a spear or a bow or. Uh, a firearm that would, that would fall under provincial rule. Municipally, they can put extra rules in place as well. 
Okay. But, um, like they can say, well, not in our city, you ain't, you can't, no, no firearms or, or no single projectiles, for example, Corporation of Delta, mm-hmm. I guess we're a yeah. city now, city of Delta. And, but from the use of a firearm would come down to, can you legally discharge it? Well, you can discharge a firearm anywhere it's lawful to do so. Well, that's then brings into, you can have a loaded firearm anywhere you're allowed to lawfully discharge it. Can I lawfully discharge my handgun out in the woods? And this is getting perhaps a little off topic. If ATTs, if, if what you're saying is that ATTs aren't going to be affected, it's the ATCs. I must have misread that part. But, um, the, from my understanding, not a lawyer, the only thing stopping you from using your firearm out in the woods would be an ATT, which is why many law enforcement mm. can go out in the woods and shoot their pistols just fine mm. because huh. they've got that blanket transport. I have, I have a different a understanding. Fascinating opportunity but, uh, for all, Alberta there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, given they've been pretty clear, I mean, that's the other thing that I think we haven't talked about is probably the provincial like we were already seeing that. You think back to, it's, it's funny now how, how thoroughly this shatters your, like there was, there's the before C21 amendment times and then there's the after times. <laughs> Cause before we, oh, it's I mean, huge. the big talk was Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, mm-hmm. all saying, we're not going to do this buyback. Um, Isn't Yukon and, and New yeah. Brunswick, aren't they jumping yeah. on too? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It was five totals. And, and now like this, this ban, I mean, it's the, the, to compensate, because justice has been pretty unequivocal by saying that if these ban goes through, these prohibited firearms will not be available for use. That they've been they've repeated that ad nauseum, so it doesn't sound like it'll be like a grandfathering. Like if you yeah. got a bar, you'll still be able to hunt with it until you mm. die, kind of thing. No, you won't. Um, so I think from that perspective, it's very interesting to think, and that's why we've included on some of the form letters that you know people should be emailing their provincial ministers of public safety because the bill to pay for this will probably most be felt by those provincial authorities. And it's, there's so many wedges. Like, it's funny that this one wedge, it's very obviously a, an attempt to create a liberal wedge for likely an election next spring, mm. has created, I think, probably a lot more wedges than they anticipated. So, I mean, Nick saying, don't be surprised. I think uh, he's right. But I think it might have surprised some people that it probably really shouldn't have surprised, like mm. the people that wrote it. Mm. I'd like to add to, to that, uh, if I may, that th- the, um, this bill is also quite nefarious because even though it's a federal, it would be a federal law, um, ordering confiscation essentially because you won't be able to buy, sell, or, or pass on to your heirs, it's, it's offsetting the costs of that confiscation. There's no mention of who's going to do the confiscating. Well, who's going to do mm-hmm. the confiscating is your municipal police force. So when Hunter Bill or, uh, or Hunter Joe uh, dies and someone has to come and collect the guns, well, who's going to do that? Well, that's presumably going to be the municipal police force. Well, the municipal police forces keep saying, we don't have the budgets for this. There's, there's, this is a massive, massive, uh, we're talking about millions at this point between the handguns and the, the rifles and shotguns that are involved, millions of firearms. It would be a nonstop job just to go around the provinces or the, the municipality and collect this stuff. Well, they don't, that's not, no, no police force at the moment, I mean, it, it wants to do that or has the budget to do that, or they, they're responding to 911 calls, right? They're, they're busy fighting bad guys. They don't, they don't want to turn into, they don't want to be turned into confiscation agents. Mm-hmm. So this is again, federally, who's going to, who's de facto, as my understanding is going to be charged with execution. It's the municipalities and no well, one's talking about that. Well, the really interesting one for me for example, Alberta, when they came out and they said, okay, we've got the RCMP here. We've got their tasks. They're under contract. We're not going to use our money to fund the RCMP to do this extra duty outside of their normal policing duties to go confiscate the firearms. That was interesting, but they went further and they said, we're looking at enacting legislation to prevent the federal government from funding the RCMP or allowing them to confiscate these firearms. How do we have federal laws in Canada that provincially can be opted out of that? I, you know, that's an interesting one. It's an untenable situation. Well, what I understand from Alberta and Saskatchewan is they're preparing their own, uh, I just took a very brief look at this stuff in the past few days, right? They're planning their own firearms acts to require licensing of any confiscation agents. So they're going to. Uh, they're good. I guess they're going to have lawyer people who are actual lawyers, not, not some blogger, but, uh, who are finding very creative ways to say, we're not having your confiscations here. Mm-hmm. 
Well, I mean, that's a brilliant one because that, that licensing thing, I mean, you first read it and you think it sounds pretty harmless, but I mean, who, who currently administers those licenses? If you wanted to take a course, who would you take it from? Travis? Mm -hmm. It's private individuals, private sector mm -hmm. businesses. They can refuse customers for various mm -hmm. reasons. Mm -hmm. So it'd be very easy for the instructors in Alberta to just go, well, we're just not going to take any potential confiscation agents on as potential students so they can't get licensed. And that kind of stalls it there. Um, I love which that. Again, it all you just can be highlights. otherwise designated by a firearms officer. They do have a section in That's there. That's true, for, yeah. <clears throat> and but I think which that has would, happened. But I mean, the Alberta chief firearms officer ain't about to appoint anyone. Right. Right? Like it's right. it's Fortress Alberta as a as a BCer that's halfway between Vancouver and Calgary. Um it's basically <laughs> Fortress Alberta. Like they they've they've got a pretty decent amount of buttresses against it there. Mm -hmm. Um and I've heard for a long time, people that have been around guns for probably seven plus years might know that like non-compliance, when Trudeau was first elected, non-compliance was always discussed as the thing that the liberals feared most. Mm -hmm. um, we heard it from liberal party insiders back then that, that anything they looked at passing, they were always concerned that compliance would be low because the long gun registry compliance was never greater than 50%. And that was always what killed them on the costing. Mm -hmm. when, way back when we went through all that, and I remember it vividly, it was you, you spent billions of dollars and you got 50% of the guns. It's pointless, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they're still sensitive about that. And I think, you know, with C21 and with what's going on in Alberta, this, this semi-automatic ban is, has really stolen all the air out of the room for sure, for obvious reasons, because it's massive. Mm -hmm. um, but when you view it, when you kind of pull back and view the forest for the trees and you contextualize that this is an amendment to a bill that was already being opposed openly by the entire Prairie Provinces, Yukon, New Brunswick, um, it does change the perspective a bit. If people are starting to panic, well... I don't know, it kind of changes the math a bit for me personally. Like I work in the industry, it's a game changer for sure. Mm -hmm. But looking at all those things, it does at least give me a little bit of hope of going, yeah, you know what, there is, the system might kind of work, maybe. Mm -hmm. There's enough pushback, enough feedback, enough political pressure, enough friction that maybe this won't go through. You feel they got a little too greedy? They threw too much on that boat and it's starting to sink? Or do you think it was by design, perhaps? I worry because I think that we can all conclude that the Liberal Party has access to better data than any of us have. Mm -hmm. um, they are incredibly efficient. They have won two elections now by losing them, as in mm. they get less <laughs> votes than other people, but they win the election. That's efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, and I worry about that because this stuff does play in. And if anyone's, again, people got to step, if, you're, if you haven't, step out of your echo bubble and just Google Carrie Price on Twitter. Just Google mm -hmm. it. And look at not not the results that you want to see, but just scroll through them and read them all because you'll find that it's probably about 50-50. That mm -hmm. there's a lot of people of, oh yeah, you know, happy to stand with them, happy to see them standing up for, for all that stuff. And there's a lot of people saying they're going to throw his jersey in the garbage and stuff like that. So it's, it's pretty even. Um, and I think people should probably keep that in context. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I want to say so. Um, Ultimately, I guess the, the pragmatist in me wants to say that on exit polling, gun politics never actually cracks the top 10 on why people cast a ballot. Mm. Um, so will this be the reason people vote for Justin Trudeau or don't? No. Will this be the reason that people volunteer for a political party? Yes. Will this probably create more... Does this create exponentially more leverage within the NDP and the Bloc Québécois for gun owners to create change within those party structures? Absolutely. That's mm -hmm. the big takeaway. I think if gun owners are looking at this for the absolute, like, what is the absolute best thing that could happen from this? It would be gun owners liaising with the NDP and the Bloc and, and effectively taking guns off the political table by doing so. By, by using this as an opportunity to recognize the liberals have opened the door for us to have a conversation here and for us to have that conversation with all of the other parties that want to um, and clarify that, we, like I said, we license the people. We don't, we license who has guns. I wouldn't want to be in a room with someone with criminal intent, whether they were armed with a 22 or a 50 cal. It wouldn't matter. I'm probably right. not getting out of the room alive. So right. we control the people. Let's spend a lot less effort controlling the individual things, a lot less time, a lot less money. Um, I think that that could probably work for the Bloc and the NDP. Those parties want to spend a lot of money. Um, 
which means they probably need to look at saving money right now. It's one of those things where you got to look. The economy is kind of a perfect storm where they got to look at saving if they want to spend. Trudeau's opened the door with this semi-automatic ban. I think that's the, that is the big thing. I'd love to see the NDP shift back to a Jack Layton-esque gun agnostic perspective. Mm-hmm. I think it'd be the best, honest to God, for gun owners. I think it'd be the best for Canada. It'd be the best for the NDP. I voted for the NDP in the past. I'm not... Like it's, I voted for every party in the past at some points. Like it's, it's very important that we have a three-party system and the health of that is, it relies on the NDP not being the Liberals' lapdogs. So you bring up a good point about the communication, Carrie Price getting up there and everyone's like, you know, I stand behind him and I, it was going to be one of the questions I'm saving uh, to the end, but we're into it now. You guys are both media professionals. From your perspective, uh, how should those who are affected be communicating their concerns and communicating through social media, through their uh, MLAs, through their MPs? Like what, what should, what should be happening on a communication standpoint? Because I, I see some groups, some businesses, some individuals even are trying to make hashtags popular. So it's used as a marketing tool for themselves, which I guess is great for them to, to market in their way, unless they come under some form of censure and everyone can make that association, the, uh, the attacking point, which is what's happening right now with the CCFR and, and the, uh, the hashtag we stand with them and they didn't like the, uh, the code that was used. I just got some information on that. I don't know all the ins and outs, but I guess there is some, uh, hue and cry saying they use a distasteful discount code. And, um, now the message is disappearing and everyone's focusing on the, that, I guess, marketing aspect of it. Should people be staying away from that? How, how should we be communicating? I mean. Does it change? It's tough. I don't know if it changed. That's kind of what I'm at is, is I think Carrie's, Carrie Price's point is unchanged. Mm -hmm. I think, um, the discount code's unfortunate. There's all you can do. Uh, Just to be blunt, because we can't, I'm not going to dance around this subject for the entire conversation. I think the discount code was unfortunate. I see how they did it. Like it was two weeks ago. It was long before the anniversary. And, and in that sort of situation, Polly St. Suviant has taken the name obviously of kind of polytechnique, which is where the shooting occurred, the similar component being poly. Um, so I can see both sides. I can see why the CCFR used it. I can see why people think it's distasteful. Um, I don't think it distracts from any of this though. Just like I don't think like gun owners, like this gun owners love the drama. We just follow mm. the drama. We, the Trudeau does the band. We love the drama. And then it's the organizations, the drama, we just distract from all that. It's human C21, nature. The problem with it was in day one, It only impacted licensed gun owners. Carrie Price makes a tweet saying they're banning a bunch of hunting guns again. The problem is fundamentally, it only impacts licensed gun owners. No Mm. criminals are losing any of their guns. If you are a criminal without a gun license, you cannot be charged with the contravention of any of these laws. You just can't. You're not actually contravening these laws, so they can't charge you with it. All of this stuff is a distraction. Um, Wow. And I think in, in that regard, like people are going to make a lot of hay of the, and and I think from what the rumors are, we're going to see it probably continue for the next little bit that things are going to continue to go poorly with this discount code and whatnot. Um, again, it doesn't really matter. Like we're supposed to be a country of serious people with a serious government that spends a bunch of serious amounts of money on this stuff. Um, I'm a little bit personally, I'm actually like, again, big, I'm not a hockey guy, so when I say I'm a big Carey Price fan, I'm a Carey Price fan for him standing up the way he has. I have mm. a tremendous amount of respect for the manner in which that man has stood up for mental health and gun rights in this country. Mm-hmm. Um, for men, it's incredibly important. Um, but I'm also a bit insulted that this government produces a law that doesn't do anything good. Everyone says, from police officers, chiefs, lawyers, gun advocates, industry members, even people that have had, you know, victims groups say this won't work. And the government doesn't do anything. Anti-gun criminal defense Anti-gun lawyers. Anti-gun groups say it's not going to work. Government mm. keeps going. They add a bunch of semi-automatic hunting guns to it. Everyone that's involved goes, this is banning a bunch of hunting guns. The government's response, you're lying. An mm. NHL goaltender makes an Instagram post 
and now the government takes it seriously. I find that, yeah. to use some extreme language, fucking insulting. Mm -hmm. Because I count as much as he does. Like, mm -hmm. I'm a citizen of Canada. I pay taxes just like he does. I own a business, just like I'm assuming Carrie Price probably owns a business at this point. Mm -hmm. Why is it that he makes an Instagram post and Justin Trudeau suddenly has to reconsider his list, but when countless witnesses, countless police officers, countless lawyers, and countless stakeholders stand up and say the exact same fucking thing to him, he doesn't say a goddamn word except, oh, that's misinformation, that's lying, don't believe the hype, we're not banning hunting guns. Like, that is fundamentally offensive. And again, the drama around this promo code, the drama around the organizations, it's just a distraction. We got a government that is literally governing by Instagram and it's right. freaking yeah. bullshit. Like right. gun owners should be pissed about that, not about this stuff. They should well, be they pissed be, at the fact that an Instagram post is what made Trudeau take notice. That's the world. That's, I totally agree. And unfortunately, that's the world we live in of, it's this, it's this, we live in a world of circus and superficial and appearances. Right. So if we're going to be governed by public perception, how do we comport ourselves or use that in order to be able to achieve an end goal that's going to be beneficial for everybody? I think, so I'll just opine here that the, the one thing is that I've done uh, is I've written to my member of um, federal parliament and my member of provincial parliament uh, legislature to say, I oppose this, I urge you to vote against this or to, to uh, in the case of provincial, they're not going to vote against it, but to say, you know, thank you for, you for what you're doing and standing up for gun owners or basically mm -hmm. to communicate with them to say that, hey, this issue matters to me and I vote based on it. Mm -hmm. So letters, I think letters are, are polite and, and, you know, professional letters are useful. I think also for me, a, a, another silver lining here is that Bill C-21 is unenforceable. There is no enforcement mechanism to confiscate all these firearms. And that is a sign of hope. It's risky because any single person can be targeted and your house can be raided and they can, they'll find what they find. But the mass confiscation is absolutely, is just unenforceable. It's entirely mm. reliant on the goodwill of individuals. And I think that a lot of individuals don't have that goodwill at this point. And so they will, if they will de facto become outlaws. Not because of what mm. they've done or any kind of harmful intent, but simply because they've been standing on one side of the line, they played the bargain, they got all their paperwork, they followed all the laws, and the government arbitrarily, capriciously, perhaps even with malice, redrew the boundaries, repositioned the line and put us on the other side of it. So it's unenforceable. And, and that I take, I take hope from that. Mm. Your earlier point though, of this legislation being incredibly harmful from the perspective of its ability to disillusion people mm. and the, the division that it causes and whatnot. Because I think the fracturing that all this is causing among society, the vitriolic, th this didn't exist. Like for, for mm -hmm. any new gun owners, because I, I forget that like, I am, I'm 37, I'm not that old. I've been in guns for 12 or 14 years, I guess now. Um, long enough that I remember the old long gun registry fight. And back then there was not this acrimonious attitude. If you're a gun owner, it would be maybe maybe one in 10 Canadians would be like really anti-gun, you know, like most of them were kind of just like, yeah, okay. Like that's, I'm not really into it, but cool. You know, that was the majority of people because mm. we kind of accepted that we didn't have the U.S.'s gun problem. That was the, that was Canada. If you think about growing up under Chrétien and then under Harper, most people would think, oh yeah, we used to think of ourselves as a country that didn't have America's gun problem. And now Canadians do think we have that problem, but the number hasn't changed. Our right. gun homicide rate has remained largely the same. So it becomes more, when you say like, how do we combat this? Is, is it, is it a case of public perception? Do we need to get more people like Carrie Price on side to support us? I don't know because we haven't really changed. Like the perception has shifted for no reason. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think gun owners kind of have to accept that. Like when I say no reason, we all know the reason the government has shifted the perspective by mm -hmm. continuing to make guns sound more dangerous at every juncture. And I think you got to be realistic as a gunner and go, how do you fight the government? How can we possibly beat the government at PR? Well, that's pretty tough. Uh, so you have to look at other alternatives. And I think that's the realistic option that is confronting gun owners now is it's not a case of we need to make guns acceptable in Canadian society because that's never going to happen. 
Let's just get mm. that right out the window. Let's, why do I say that? Well, let's look at the most gun-accepting country in the world, America. Are guns controversial in America? Yes. Okay. So in the most gun-contented world, like country with the most guns, it's still controversial. It doesn't seem likely that we're going to move from a gun that, or a country that generally is mediocre to disliking guns to a country that loves guns. That seems unlikely. We're much better off just using our political leverage. The dairy farmers of Canada have been proudly propping up supply management for decades through nothing other than political will. Mm. They don't go out there and try and make people feel great about milk. That's actually the dairy farmers of America with their milk campaign. They just <laughs> quietly go about and do the political work they have to do. And I, and some people may hear this and go, well, that sounds like nefarious gun lobby back room stuff. No, what I mean by that is just be freaking honest. Yeah. Just stand up and go, yeah, we're serious about public safety. Absolutely. This is what we want. We are the experts on public safety with guns because we own them all. We're the ones that mm. keep them. We know the licensing regime because we have them. Nobody you wants know, to keep on our all those families. Things. Nobody wants to keep our, our husbands, wives, kids safer than we do. And, and to be honest... If you take it back to, to gain, because people like to use analogies, this whole convince the entire public is, is kind of the equivalent of like trying to run like a student union election when you're trying to convince the, the principal of something. Mm -hmm. Like you're the two separate entities here. Mm -hmm. Like we can convince the public the guns are great. Yeah, sure. Or we could convince 338 people to not fuck with them. Mm -hmm. That's it. There's 338 people on one side. And 36 million on the other. Which one would you rather convince? Like, it is literally a list of 338 people. Like, to be very clear, the gun community mm -hmm. needs to convince 338 people in Ottawa that the licenses they hold and the gun system we have works. 338 people. There's 2.3 million of us. There's 338 of them. We used to work on that math, and it used to work. Now we've got this whole, well, let's convince the public first and let it trickle down, where we tell the public, and then slowly over time, Carrie Price hears about it, and Carrie Price makes an Instagram post, and Carrie Price makes it, and Trudeau sees it, and then he changes the law. We were better off just talking to Trudeau. When he mm. used to get 6,000 emails and letters in one day, he'd go, oh, Jesus Christ, no, never mind, I'm backing off. Yeah, that was better. So if we're governed by public opinion, how do we, how do we make this something that those who are unaffected, who don't own firearms or have no interest in firearms, how do we bring this on the table so that they actually have a stake and they're interested in conveying their concerns to government? I don't think they should be, to be clear. If you don't have a stake in firearms and you don't have the knowledge and you haven't taken it upon yourself to go and learn the existing infrastructure of laws and regimes, storage rules, regulations, I don't really give a shit what your feeling on guns is because it's a feeling. It's not knowledge. It's a feeling. Like, what I'm scared problems? of small spaces. There's nothing wrong with them. I'm just I, scared I think, of them. It's a feeling. I, I think we can um, educate, and I don't mean preach at, I, I'm guilty of preaching at, but educate, uh, sure. share information with our uh, family and friends and colleagues about, and we don't even have to mention the word guns. Oh, like, I, and I don't know how this would come up, uh, but there are people in my entourage I'm thinking of the person I live with. She doesn't really care about guns or know much about them, but she understands that a lot of everything Daniel just said, she would agree with that it's, it's, um, uh, not about the 338 uh, individuals, but about the wrongheadedness, the nefariousness, the sneakiness of what is right. happening legislatively. Now, maybe this is a little very, again, back to this small self-selecting sample. Most people don't give a hoot about legislative policy or regulatory affairs. That's just not their thing. So. To your question, how do you reach people? How does a non-gun person or someone who doesn't have, um, for whom guns don't really matter in their day-to-day -day life, how do we reach those people? I don't know, other than the old faithful, take them to the range and put a smile on their face. What, what about from the perspective of like Canadian Taxpayers Federation talking about the price involved the and people saying, well, I don't care about guns, but geez, that's a lot of money we could put elsewhere. Or yes. uh, people saying they're confiscating property, doesn't, doesn't matter, it's not mine, but if there's a uh, analogy that could be made that say, well, maybe your property could be confiscated like in real estate or if Without they want to enact. Without compensation. 
without compensation. I mean, may, maybe talking about the firearm issue is ancillary, although of high importance of those who are affected who own firearms, but maybe the bigger conversation is for the populace to be writing their letters in is yeah. something that's going to be how this is being enacted. Well, the, the, the example, one example, maybe it was one of you guys who, who mentioned it. So uh, credit where credit's due, but people have used the example of cars or uh, cars. You know, let's say the government says we're banning, uh, we're, we're confiscating uh, fossil fuel engines, cars with fossil fuel engines. We're, um, date X, let's say 2035, we're confiscating them all and we're not going to compensate you. Is, is that on the dock? I don't think so. Is it, is it imaginable? Well, it's not crazy or any object any object that the government decides we don't like these, we're confiscating them and we're going to do it in a sneaky, devious way, running a disinformation campaign saying the people who own these objects are evil people and pass laws, that sneak in amendments at the last minute. It's, it's not, um, it's not hard to imagine this happening for other objects. Maybe that's a way to go. I don't know. It's tough though, because you always think on the opposite side, like if you do the old red team thought experiment thing, that there's going to be, like when you do that, you think, let's try and do the public sentiment thing. Let's try and get people frustrated with the process, that this is an amendment instead of, like the OIC thing, I tried that so hard to try and impress upon people. This was not a democratic solution. It was effectively an executive order. No one cared. Um, it went exactly nowhere, unfortunately, mm -hmm. Yeah. which might color my response here, but um, with, I think also too, from a political analyst perspective, Trudeau has ushered in a new era in much the same way as the Fords did. Um, with the Ford government in Toronto and now Ontario, they've run incredibly effective grassroots social media campaigns that have been marked with incredibly low costs. If anyone follows politics, like they spend very little. And they have incredibly large reach on social media and it's very popular and effectively is in some ways very similar to the Trudeau campaign. And that's why I say it's a new era because he's entered this era of efficient politics that is only attainable by social media because you have to have the ability to pull very tight geographic areas on very specific issues to get data that allows you to extrapolate this stuff out. And I worry that if gun owners try and do this political like try and change everyone's mind thing first that effectively will kind of be in a game of whack-a-mole mm -hmm. against the opposition. And as much as we're constantly trying to whack the, the anti-gun moles down, be like, nope, 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 nope. There's going to be a strategist out there constantly finding new populations of people in ridings that we're going to have to go and find. So until you kind of get, like you're kind of going to need to get a, a decent, like, you know, 20% message incursion into every given riding for that to be effective. And it, that's where mm. these strategies start to fall down. I think this is where this gets into the larger discussion of gun owner politics in Canada, where it's incredibly frustrating because 2.3 million people with gun licenses in Canada constitute one of, absolutely one of the largest identifiable vote blocks in the country. Mm. Like if you can say there's a single thing that ties everyone together, that and Ford pickup truck ownership are kind of the two big ones, right? Like those mm. are the big ones. But unfortunately, because our country's so big, 2.3 million people spread out across 338 ridings does not equate to enough votes to sway most electoral outcomes. Mm. And especially in this era of new efficient politics, where I think, unfortunately, unless there's a way, unless someone can come up with a PR campaign they win the, the next three years is going to convert urban Toronto and GVRD voters to pro gun, like mm. straight up more than 50% pro gun. Um, I think that's effectively a waste of money to invest in, to be quite honest, mm. kind of like, cause again, this is where to add some context, social media plays into all this stuff in a dramatic way, but social media is also incredibly censored for guns. Like all of us, Nick, you, Travis, we've all talked sure. about that. You try and put stuff on Facebook or Instagram and it's incredibly restricted by being gun content. Yeah. Even if you're not gun content that you're putting up, but you're a gun business. I just got exactly. a notice back from TikTok the other day. I said, sorry, you're not going to be shown to the same audience. And I'm looking through what I have. There's, there's one video of me walking with a rifle over and one of a scope and not talking about guns, not promoting guns. 
the one that was looking at being promoted was on survival equipment. They said, no, sorry. And Draft I think category. And that's like, I get, I get, I used to run father, my biggest one was Father's Day sales. I'd run Father's mm. Day sales for magazine subscriptions. Used to make a good amount of money off the Facebook ads. Now I can't even get the ad approved. And we don't sell guns, I guess, mm. you know, but we promote the sale of firearms and ammunition apparently. So we're banned. When you consider, like again, pulling back in five or 10 years time, where do we want to be? Well, we're probably not going to be allowed on social media. Straight mm. up. The way things are going, it's very unlikely that based on its current ownership change, Twitter may be an exception, but Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, there will probably be no gun content allowed, right? I mean, there used to be a gun emoji. If you doubt that, there was a straight up gun emoji. It's now a squirt gun. Right. <laughs> so we are getting kicked out of the social media circus where politics will be more and more important, again, leading us to the end conclusion that gun owners really need to invest in the politics side of things because we, unfortunately, have to confront the stacked deck that winning the public debate is to be quite blunt, I think impossible. If the gun ownership, if, if gun ownership in Canada is going to become widely acceptable, it's going to do so organically. And I say that by way of like, it's going to be, uh, to be quite honest, in a circumstance that probably none of us want. Mm. Through circumstances like a war breaking out or some sort of unrest yeah. where people feel so insecure that they feel that their only way of being secure is having a gun of their own. And some people may think that's a great thing. I personally don't. I think it'd be a bad situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think Canada, with our 2.3 million licensed gun owners and all the money that we donate to any organization, is going to be able to sway the court of public opinion to 50% in favor of guns. Mm -hmm. So if you view that as the outcome, then you have to go, well, what are our alternatives? Well, the alternatives are to work directly on the political actions, work directly with politicians, work directly with parties. And I don't, again, it's not partisan because this shouldn't be a partisan issue. We should be availing ourselves to every party to say, hey, I'm here to provide you with the expert knowledge you need to know about gun stuff so that you can pass good policy and keep people mm -hmm. safer. And so it's really, it's, it's almost naively altruistic to say so, but I, I just don't see, I think we have to be realistic about our, our, you know, the first thing, whenever you have a plan, have a goal. What is our right. goal with this public? What is our goal with the, like, I, if someone can tell me what the goal is, like maybe you can. What's the goal? If we're trying to reach out to the, how, what is the goal of this public? Can we convince 50%? What's the percentage we're reaching? Mm -hmm. I think. How many do we need to reach? How do you change a conversation? How do you find a public trend? That's something that you can jump on that is trending. If we're going to use a social media, um, But if you terms. jump on a trend, how, how resilient does that change? Like this Carey Price thing, for example, right? Like a lot of people might be shifting their views. Maybe some people have shifted their views going, oh, he's, he's my idol and he says it, so I'll change my view. If that's all it took, it's not a very entrenched view. You'll probably shift back. I, I, I guess it depends on what the trend is. I mean, like the, the trend of when we talk about hunting or uh, self-sufficiency through COVID, people wanted to protection. They wanted to be self-sufficient. Uh, I, I think framing the conversation a little bit differently and having firearms just happen to be a part of it, as opposed to from my cold dead hands and having the gun front and center might be the way, cause you're right. Meta, which owns Facebook and Instagram and Google, which owns YouTube. And they're, they're not allowing gun content in the way they have in the past, but there are, there is other content that they will want to see on there because it's trending. And because that's how they make their money is through the views. Uh, maybe there's a way to just have the conversation change a little bit. Not that we want to, but just from a realistic standpoint, like you say. Oh, I think it could. And I think that's one of those, it has to be reactive. Like you said, it's got to be, you got to see the trends and respond to them, kind of grab them when you can. Um, and I think react to, to trends that are occurring in the real world and reflect them back. Um, I think that's kind of like maybe a bit antithetical to my personal nature. I tend to be a bit more like, <laughs> I just kind of want to plan and, and just get on those tracks and roll down them rather right, than kind right. of react. And, and that's probably where I do view a bit of the, like, there are a lot of things that I think public sentiment is counter to what our politicians do mm. that our politicians just don't let get raised to the issue of any kind of debate because mm -hmm. it's been settled. I mean, supply management is one. Most Canadians don't like supply management. It raises prices, you, you name it, but mm. it's just a non-starter for the NDP, the Liberals, and the Conservatives. 
because those people that are involved in spy punishment have effectively communicated their interests to politicians, and now the politicians have those interests in their best hearts too. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we see a road there, and it's kind of, I guess I also must say, perhaps there's a bit of um, unknown bias that I haven't recognized before this, but as a gun industry member, perhaps I simply draw more parallels with the dairy industry than the ability to <laughs> sway public opinion. Sure, sure. <laughs> There's a couple aspects also that I think we haven't mentioned yet that I, th that I think are worth mentioning. And one is that uh, guns are, a, a, unfortunately, a terrible political thing. Like we don't align on gun ownership. Of those 2.3 million voters, there's, as I suspect, as many who vote NDP as liberal, as conservative, as other parties that I suspect the, the, the vote distribution is roughly – equal to party votes. And there are lots of gun owners who voted for the liberals three times in a row. And even after Trudeau promised mass confiscations voted for them because guns are not their number one voting interest. So one mm -hmm. is a lot of gun owners actually vote liberal or for other prohibitionists. The second thing is in terms of convincing, I, this is a, a bit of a, a complaint, uh, with a smile that Forget about convincing Joe Voter, we have gun owners who are in denial and the, the mm -hmm. gun clubs, just, just an example that was related to me in the spring, perhaps a few weeks before the May 30th announcement, uh, handgun club near Toronto, the board is coming up for election or planning the year ahead and they are in complete denial after uh, the prime minister has said repeatedly, repeatedly for years, he wants to confiscate handguns. This handgun club was not doing anything different, not stepping up its recruiting efforts, not budgeting differently. Hey, what if we get shut down? No mm. change. Not talking about handguns, not promoting handgun ownership or handgun sports. Total denial, total head in the sand, total old school game of if we just keep quiet, they'll leave us alone. Doesn't work. It, and here's, it, again, it's real world I find examples. that terribly frustrating. Mm -hmm. Real world examples of what Nick is talking about. You got two, let's say you're Joe gun owner. You got two options. You belong to that Toronto gun club, right? You can, and again, I feel like I'm, I'm going to have to take it easy because I'm beginning to preach, but this is the last <laughs> bit. we've done preach, really well. Preach. <laughs> <laughs> you can try and convince the public. And if you do so, you'll probably turn to social media because that's how most people broadcast, right? These days. And you'll make your Facebook posts and you may, if you're a popular person, get a couple hundred people interacting with you, right? Of those couple hundred, probably none of them will actually communicate. If they have your concerns, none of them will communicate that to the legislator who's going to Ottawa, right? They'll all just give their happy faces and they'll say this sucks or that's too bad or you suck, you name it. Mm -hmm. um, if you went to your gun club with a hundred pieces of paper with letters pre-printed to the MP of that gun club and you just said, sign this, I'll mail it for you. You just sign it. That's it. I'll put the gun club's return address on it, so it's fine. You just sign it. There, you're a constituent. You're good to go. Now the MP of that area has 100 pieces of communication saying this law is bad. What's the what is more likely to create the actual change we're looking for here? Because ultimately, you can say that the end result of the social media campaign is that those people that commented may change their vote in the next election. Maybe. It's pretty tenuous because we interact with social media a million times a day. So no one remembers it. If you sign a letter, you remember it. So even if you've got a gun owner, like Nick said, that's maybe a little bit wishy-washy and he walks into that gun club going, well, we're just going to approve the same budget because nothing changed. Then you hold a letter up and they go, wow, like you actually took the time to print a hundred. This is a real thing. Oh yeah. Look at the law. You show them. Well, now you've got a hundred votes and letters. Mm -hmm. Like that's where it comes into the we got to stop thinking about the public and stop thinking about social media and the media, to be quite honest, at large, and start thinking about, are there letters on my gun club counter? Because if your gun club doesn't have three piles of letters for people to take, sign, and mail in with instructions printed right there saying you don't need postage, hell, mm -hmm. they should have a bin right there where you just put the letter in, they mail it for you. Mm -hmm. If your gun club and your gun stores don't have that, you shouldn't be posting anything about guns on social media. You should be taking letters to your gun club and you should mm -hmm. be telling them to buy envelopes because it's in their mm -hmm. best interests. Like that's the real change here. Like that's, and, and I'm starting to see it. Like to be clear, like I'm sounding a bit ranty, but I'm starting to see it. I go on Reddit, I see the big stacks and like to be very honest, I wanted a chance to say like, as someone's in the industry whose entire family, my livelihood is tied to this. Like it's a huge, 
huge boost to see, to go on Reddit and see people with stacks of letters being mm-hmm. like, I'm going to go bomb the mailbox, with like 400 letters. And it's, mm-hmm. it's the Senate, it's the MPs and they're all proud of it. Like it takes me right back to early long gun registry days, like when we were effective and it's awesome. And I think that's where people got to like stop being distracted. You know, it's great. The carry price stands with us. That's great. Now go print a letter. Like mm-hmm. that's what it comes down to. In politics, they always talk about knock a door because door knocking is the basic fundamental grassroots political effort. So the running joke is that's a great idea. Have you knocked a door? Gun owners should be doing the same thing. It's a great idea. Have you sent a letter? It's free. It's a piece of freaking paper. Your boss won't miss it if you print it off at work. They'll never know. <laughs> like, just print them off and get them in the mail. Like it's that simple. You just, it's that easy, you know? Um, and that's where the change comes in. So I think that's that's the big thing is really really impressing upon people that like they can change things. They just got to stop thinking about, you know, just talking to social media and Facebook posts and Twitter and all this and actually talk like there are only three, again, there are 338 people who make these decisions. There are 2.3 million of us. Like this, this shouldn't be difficult. This really shouldn't even be on the table. If we were at all effective as a lobbying entity, when it's almost comical when these anti-gun groups talk about the strength of the pro-gun lobby, because I mean, two point three million yeah, it of is us. Comical. And, yeah, what how many th- people are in the dairy industry? How do you how do you yeah. respond to the people who say, and I, I think it's legitimate. I understand this uh, this response. I I'm not. No one's getting my guns. I don't want to send a letter. I don't want to go on the record as flagging myself as being a concerned party or, you know, that I own anything. I just want to, I'm just going to go dark. I'm just going to quietly not comply. What do you, uh, what's a good response to, to help to tell those people? That you can quietly non comply and voice your concern mutually. Like they're not mutually exclusive whatsoever. There's no legal, like if you sign a letter, if you write a letter to the prime minister saying, I don't agree with this law, there's no legal thing saying that you're in contravention of it whatsoever. Like, and and moreover, like I'd almost kind of say like, that's a really weird moralistic perspective to take. Like it's a very like, and Frank, is it my daughter kind of perspective to take? Like, like it's very like. Well, I, but I understand it because if they, if you don't trust the government, if you think that this government, if these, if this, if this group of 330, if you're, they know, if you're making a you social a, media yeah, post yeah. saying I'm not sending a letter, they already know. Mm. Absolutely. But so that, that's why they say we're staying off. So I guess, I guess I can understand it. People who say that if you don't trust these politicians and you believe that they are some version of nefarious, malicious, evil, bad, uh, disingenuous, dishonest, they're, they're, they're up to no good. You're just going to quietly, you have a bunch of non-restricted guns that are now to be confiscated. You're just going to quietly do your thing and, and not make, not essentially go dark not send a letter, not go on social media and advertise the fact that you oppose this. Uh, I, I, I understand it and I wish I had a, a response and I agree with you. You can still send a letter. If we live in a country where you cannot, where you're too scared to send a letter to your politician, then we are in deep trouble. I don't think mm-hmm. we're there yet. I hope we never get there. Um, but I just also know that when I say that to people, they're not convinced. They, yeah. And I guess that's where you get into the like, you can't convince everyone, right? Yeah. I mean, and I think... And I, Travis and I have talked about this before in, the, in past podcasts of, of like social media is a tempest in a teapot. Like I keep saying, there's 2.3 million licensed gun owners out there. There's 5 million gun owners in Canada. And I'll say non-criminal gun owners is in like, they've never committed an actual crime in contravention of the criminal code as in like violence or injuring someone, but they're in possession of a firearm illegally because mm. they got it back in the FAC days. And I say it's 50% because yep. the registry only captured 50%. So... If you go with, well, let's go with even 4.5 million gun owners out there that aren't committing crimes, you know, it's just kind of like, I don't know, like, we know that statistically speaking, they're older. We know that the majority of them are over 45. We know the majority of people on social media are under 35. We know that people over 55 spend like five, two and 5% of all social media traffic is people over 55. So the vast majority of our gun owners that we're relying on to send letters and be that grassroots are not on social media. So when, when that one guy goes, well, I'm not going to send a letter. My response is like, I don't care. I got a hundred of them down at the gun shop. Right. I guarantee you they'll be gone. So Mm -hmm. one guy like, and again, this is kind of the thing where gun owners have to get a bit more, 
I don't know. I don't know if it's like a business perspective or a capitalist perspective of, of think about where you're expending your effort and your assets and your resources and do it efficiently. If some guy mm-hmm. is, if you're spending four hours of your day arguing or God knows two years of your life arguing with people on Twitter, like various well-known anti-gun Twitter names, just mm-hmm. block them. It's a waste of your time. Like literally go whittle a canoe. It's a better use of, don't do nothing about guns. Be a better child to your, or father to your children. Do anything other I, I than argue the, with people on the, social media. The good news there, I think for, I'm on Twitter, I'm not on Facebook or Instagram, but but I think the good news there is that there's very, like the Twitter is, is I'm going to say it's insignificant in terms of the gun debate. It's, 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 uh, when I look at the retweets, likes, follows, it's insignificant. Yeah. The numbers are just... The numbers are insignificant, yeah. It's, it's a very lively discussion. I think that's why it, it gets confused for the actual discussion because there's a few people that really, you know, it's a small community of people like talking about it. I like it, well, but it's I definitely like it. I'm on it, too I'm frequently. there too, but in terms yeah. of, I guess it's, it's insignificant, I guess, in terms of reach. We're very yes. smart people who are on, on Twitter uh, posting very inform, important messages, but we're, we're not reaching things. And that's where the Kerry Price thing comes in. Why was Kerry Price so remarkable? Because... Instead of reaching five or 50 or 500 people, he reached, I don't know what the numbers are now, but, but thousands or tens of thousands. So it's, and oh, the media millions. picked up he's on it. Is it millions? millions? On his, oh, I think okay. his Instagram post. I think he's got millions of followers on Instagram. He's a popular guy. Okay. So he, he, he reached, he reached a lot of people. That's why it's, that's why it's quite mm. significant. But I can, I can I guarantee you that nobody in my entourage has ever heard of Kerry Price. Well. My best friend would absolutely <laughs> kill for his autograph. So, Carrie, if you're listening, by all means, you can sign a copy of the magazine. <laughs> I had never heard of him before two days ago. Um, well, he got flack for those that, again, those that don't remember, he got flack years ago for uh, a picture he posted on Instagram flying, tying a fly with his daughter uh, with an NFA flag in the background. This mm. would be four or five years ago. It would be might longer. It was... Maybe even the Sean Bevins days of the NFA, but yeah, it was he. He was quite outspoken then. He took when, flack for it then, and he stuck. He stood by it. That's why I think this is an honest to God. He he, he does him. believe this. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think I mean I, I huge I'm, bombs. I'm, and to to correct what I just said, I, I have heard his name before, but I'm not uh, I'm not a hockey guy, so I don't. Uh, he, he's maybe the only hockey player that I could name now. Sidney <laughs> Crosby. I heard of him too. Now, yeah. Now you got there two. There you go. Two. Now you got two. So, and if you're from Vancouver, everyone knows Pavel and, and Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> and I mean, I, you know, I've heard, I've heard of Wayne Gretzky also. So, I just name hockey players for the rest of the podcast. <laughs> There'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> so we've gone through a number of different things. Um, we put the question out through social media. A number of the questions that have been asked have been answered throughout this podcast. There is one here from Brock Fisher. He says, what will be involved in amending this bill or dissolving it if conservatives get in? So what, let's say they get in politically, everyone's on the side of getting rid of it. What would that look like? Probably not something that happens overnight. Not overnight, but they would need a majority. The conservatives would need a majority. And I would say that's, that's perhaps a hope that Pierre Poilievre, I I think there's an incredible political movement around him. Um, I'm going to so bookmark s- that. Okay. I'm so, so I'm going to say that one. would need a majority <laughs> to be able to undo legislation and, and, and certainly not a, not a short-term thing, but also I, I'm not, I'm not, um, I don't have much hope in the pol- political process because whether this thing goes through or not, the liberals have shown their hands and, and Daniel has said uh, publicly on, on, in an interview with me a few months ago, we're, we're some number of election cycles away from mass confiscations and perhaps right. an irrevocable end to mainstream firearm ownership in this country. Uh, that was at the time, maybe things have changed dramatically now, but I think we know where this thing is headed without a major cultural, political, social change. We know where this game ends and it's mm. not good for us. Now I said there was a bookmark and I agree with everything Nick's saying. So I'm not, not disputing because again, we all get along <laughs> famously. Um, <laughs> We actually do. That's not actually, that sounded like sarcasm and we actually do get along really well. Well, You Um, said it, man. You said I'm stealing your words. We get along great and agree on pretty much everything. Um, What I think is really interesting though, is to game out, because I agree, it needs a majority, like conventional thinking absolutely needs a majority to to rescind. Um, It'll take a full legislative act. This is one of the interesting things is... um, some of the previous stuff the Littles did, C-71, you name it, rescinded because people have forgotten, took away the ability for the governor and council to declare a firearm non-restrictive. So we're 
can't OIC things. So it's a one-way trip. So effectively, the Liberals have almost forced Pierre Polyev's hands into a full Firearms Act rewrite. Because mm. if he comes into office buoyed by a bunch of people going, well, this act is bad and we want this rescinded, the only way to really give us back these guns, the to be quite honest, the easiest way to give us back these guns at this point because the law has been so... It's like a broken down car that people have fixed on the road and rolls into the service station with 14 different brands of parts on it. And the mechanic mm. goes, this is going to take a significant work. You should just buy a new car. Mm. Um, that's what Polyev's walking into with the Firearms Act is this jalopy of a broken down junker. And his easiest solution is to blow it all up and go, no, we're just going to start from scratch. And we're going to get definitions. We're going to throw this variant crap out. We're getting rid of this FRT. We're starting from scratch. Um, so I think it's interesting the liberals of force hand. But what is more interesting to me and again, why I've been so on gun owners to get involved in the party politics side, if you have any inclination to join the NDP, do so. Because we're probably looking at a spring election. That's the common rumor, spring 2023. And what I'm about to say holds true regardless of when the election occurs, but for the reason of the conversation, it's easiest to have a time. Let's say an election happens in March of 2023. We don't know the outcome of that election. Polls will have all kinds of things, whatever. What we do know after that election is it is very unlikely that the next liberal and NDP mandates end with the same leader that they currently have. It is very unlikely that no matter if the NDP or the liberals, if the NDP won even, I mean, if they won, Jagmeet would probably stay, but that'd be the only way. Mm -hmm. Even if the liberals win, it's highly likely that Trudeau will probably step down. He's kind of intimated this is the last one he runs in, you name it. Much like when Harper left the Conservative Party, Trudeau will leave the Liberals effectively rudderless when he steps down because it's not the Liberal Party that we all have known through our childhood. It is the Trudeau Party at this point. It is much like the Conservative Party was the Harper Party. It took on the personality of the leader. There's going to be a massive change when a new leader steps in, and that massive change brings with it massive opportunity. And I think both within the Liberal Party and the NDP, Gun owners would be very well to both communicate with, if they have a liberal and NDP MP, to communicate with them that no matter what happens in the next election, they're going to be facing an internal party election. And where they come down on this issue may be very important. Because if you're a member, again, I know I'm kind of spiraling here a bit, but <laughs> the NDP does not have a large membership. So as gun owners, if you were to join the NDP, you could have a massively outsized impact on NDP policy. Like literally 10,000 gun owners could dictate NDP policy to the NDP because they're very small. Just like 100 gun owners could dictate policy to a municipal election. It's very, everything changes. Mm -hmm. Gun owners got to think about this. Think not about, the election's very important. We should all work very hard to make sure we get a majority, but also keep in mind that there is a goal beyond this election. And the goal beyond this election is to take guns out of the political hands. And the only way to do that is start interacting. And as the leaders of Jagmeet and Trudeau step down, these parties are going to be doing some serious internal reflection. And I think when you say a majority, I think there is an opportunity here to get the NDP at least back to a gun agnostic or perhaps even pro-gun side because they are the party of blue-collar union workers. This mm -hmm. policy wastes a ton of money that would be better spent on numerous social supports that the NDP would otherwise support. I mean, a billion dollars towards this gun ban goes a long way towards expanding that dental program. Yeah. These are very real points that people can be making. And I think if gun owners think about, okay, the election is the next big thing, but there's going to be party elections after and start thinking about the role that, because this election and the role guns play in it will have a way bigger impact on how the parties shape up for the next four years than it probably actually will on the election. And what I mean by that, it'll have a larger impact on whether or not the NDP and the Bloc Québécois, the Liberals, are anti-gun, pro-gun, the degree to which they're anti-gun or pro-gun, because we might see a Liberal Party come out of this next election that is not the Trudeau, urban-centric, efficient ger Toronto. And maybe they go, yeah, you know, we're, we're not really, we got creamed on, we're stepping back from gun control. You know, mm -hmm. we, we don't think, we don't have a lot of gun homicides. The liberals could entirely, it's within the realm of possibility. Dare I say it's more realistic than changing 50% of Canadians' minds? Mm -hmm. It would be nice. And we are going to be confronting the opportunity for that within the next year, realistically. And that's what I think we need to start working around now is the election's one thing, but that that's the larger issue is to start recognizing that. 
Nicholas, you have anything to add? I, I, that message gives me hope actually. The, it, it makes it, it, it's, I agree. It's, it's plausible. It's possible. It's, I don't know if it's probable, but it gives me hope that uh, change is possible. Well, if we don't have anything else to add, we've been at this for a little bit of time. I'm sure there'll probably be more questions that come down the pipe after this podcast and we can probably address them through social media or perhaps through a future podcast like this. If we don't have anything else to add, perhaps we uh, wrap it up here. What do you say? Travis, thank you very much for, for organizing this, for what you do and for having me on as your guest. I would agree with Nick, as always, with everything he says. I am in agreement because uh, we get along. Because <laughs> we get along it's been great. A great. It's been a great podcast. I've really enjoyed um, it. Always great with you, Travis, and it's fun to have uh, Nick as well because I like talking with both of you guys. So having both of you on one is it's like a it's like a threesome that I've always dreamed of. <laughs> Well, I don't know if I'd Awkward phrase it quite, quite like that one. <laughs> On but that I always, note. <laughs> I, I do always enjoy speaking with you. Your perspectives, both of you are fantastic. Uh, and Nicholas, I mirror your sentiments on what Dan said there. It leaves me with some optimism and there is some direction that we can go. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.